So now we're going to move on to talking about slope stability um, from seepage analyses. So a lot of times you'll do your seepage analyses first, and you'll have those pore pressure conditions that you'll be able to use in a slope stability analysis. So learning objectives for this course um, include talking about slope stability analyses and inputs required for those analyses. Um, I'll provide some case histories of slope instability. I'm actually going to do that first because I like case history. And then we'll talk a little bit about different inputs and how they affect the results of the slope stability analysis. So I'll go through a few examples of that. So the general cases you consider for slope stability analyses um, are construction, so during construction and end of construction, steady state seepage, so how it's going to occur, how seepage, what stability is going to look like during normal operation of the dam and during peak flood events. Um, so we we talk about that, um, and I'll talk about you know kind of how that might not be mm, what you actually see after a flood, but that's what we design for. And then talk about actually what's happening during flood loading, um, stability during floating with flood loading, which is a fairly new case that we've uh, was not included in our current guidance, um, <clears throat> but is being added into the levy guidance, levy design guidance, and will be I think eventually added into the slope stability guidance that the core uses. And then the last one is rapid drawdown. Um, so that's the stability of the embankment during a rapid uh, drawdown of the reservoir, if you have to draw down the reservoir quickly. Um, so generally, the steady state and the flood loading conditions will control the embankment design. Um, and the construction case and the rapid drawdown cases are less likely to influence the design. But I'm going to point out a couple of case histories where uh, we had some slope instability issues during construction and after rapid drawdown. So the first example here is Waco Dam. This is one of the Army Corps dams. Uh, during construction of Waco Dam in 1961, a slide occurred when the embankment was approximately 83 feet tall. The slide moved approximately 22 feet downstream and extended from stations 50 to station 65, so quite a large slide. Um, they attributed this slide to excess pore pressures in the clay shale foundation. And they also had two, found two unmapped faults that bisected the embankment, and these faults carried pore pressures to, the, to that clay shale and raised the foundation pore pressures. Um, so to fix this slide, they placed berms on the upstream and downstream side of the embankment uh, to allow them to reduce pore, that helped reduce pore pressures on the foundation, spread out the loading of that embankment, um, and that made the embankment more stable. And this dam is still in operation today. Uh, the next example is, uh, at the time, was called San Luis Dam. It's now BS Fisk Dam. This is a reclamation dam um, out in California. So in September 1981, the San Luis Reservoir was drawn down 180 feet in 120 days. So that's uh, drawn down more than one foot per day, which is pretty darn quickly. Um, and at that time, a slide occurred on the upstream slope. You can see the slide here on the figure. Um, they did an evaluation of the failure, uh, a back calculation of, this, of the failure, and they did investigations of the uh, foundation and uh, pore pressures, and they found that the slide extended down to a slope wash layer, so a foundation layer that was left in the foundation during construction. Uh, the designers and the, and the construction engineers decided to leave the slope wash in place because it was highly desiccated and hard during construction. Uh, so they didn't feel it was going to be an issue during uh, operation. Um, however, when the reservoir was filled, that slope wash was saturated. Uh, the shear strength was reduced to a fully softened shear strength. So it lost strength because it was a desiccated soil. Um, it, it, as it saturated, it lost, its, it lost a lot of its uh, drain strength. It didn't have a drain strength anymore. Um, then, likely due to cyclic loading, so this reservoir was raised and lowered on a regular basis because it was used for um, irrigation and for um, water water supply. Uh, shear deformations, um, they, they determined that shear deformations probably built up in the slope wash, and so that reduced the strength of the slope wash to somewhere between their fully softened shear strength and its residual shear strength. And I think Brian might have talked a little bit about those two shear strengths um, in a previous presentation. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, so once they hit that lower shear strength, this failure occurred. Uh, here's an overhead view of the uh, failure. So you can see it's pretty extensive. So here's the, on the pointer. here's the dam crest. Here's upstream, here's that intake tower. 
And so you can see the extent of that uh, failure, so pretty big failure. And then I also wanted to show the scarp um, on the slope because it's a pretty large scarp and you can kind of see the little people walking along it, so a pretty tall scarp. Um, they repaired this slide, buttressed the dam, and uh, BS this dam is still in operation today. Uh, so you, you can't talk about um, slope instability uh, in an Army Corps presentation without talking about Fort Peck Dam. Um, this is the biggest slope instability issue we've ever had in the Corps, um, and it is also, I think, the only one that's caused uh, life loss, um, at least at one of our dams. I'm not sure about our levees. So this is, uh, occurred during construction of Fort Peck Dam in 1938. Um, here is, so this, this is a picture of Fort Peck as it's been constructed prior to the failure. Um, here is the failure. So the right embankment of the dam slid on a weak layer of material in the bedrock uh, that they didn't know existed at the time. Um, they found out about this bedrock layer, this, this weak layer in the foundation after the slide, unfortunately. Um, so you can see that it's a very large slide. Um, at the time, there were about 180 workers um, in or near the area of the slide. Uh, one of the very lucky ones was the construction engineer in charge of the project. Um, he had been driving towards, uh, he was in a car driving towards this area of the dam because they had noticed some um, distress. There were some cracks in the core pool. Um, this dam was constructed of, let me go back here, this dam um, was constructed of hydraulic fill. So you can see the core pool here where they were depositing hydraulic fill um, and letting it settle out. And so they had seen some issues there. They had seen some changes in the shear, in the, in the uh, embankment surface, and they'd seen some cracks. So he was going to check it out. Um, but he escaped because the driver of his car, of, of the car he was in, backed away from the slide very quickly. But unfortunately, um, eight workers were killed in the, um, in the slide, uh, and six of their bodies were never recovered. So it was a pretty big deal for us um, as the, at the core. Um, and uh, just to kind of get an understanding of the volume of this slide, um, it's about 5 million cubic yards, uh, which is a bit more than the entire volume of concrete that was placed in Hoover Dam. Uh, here's just a, a few more views of that slide. So you can see the core pool kind of failed out into the reservoir. So there was some water upstream of the reservoir. They, they closed the dam up at this point, and we're just building up the top, top a little bit. Um, you can see some of the construction equipment. Uh, this shows the pipeline and trestle used in hydraulic deposition of the core, which is ripped away from the embankment um, and destroyed. And here's some more destruction of various uh, equipment that was uh, on the dam at the time of the failure. So it was a pretty large cleanup process to fix. So they did, um, they did rebuild this section of the embankment. Um, they flattened the slopes. Uh, and um, did some uh, and worked to reduce the pore pressures in hydraulic construction. Um, and Fort Peck is is still in operation today. Another one of our dams that's still working and has not had uh, slope instability issues since construction. Um, here's a levee failure. Uh, levee failures, if you've worked in levees, tend to be a little more common than dam failures. Although I don't think slope instability is one of the more common failure methods for. Uh, levees, but this one is the Marchand levee along the Mississippi River. Um, it's down near Louisiana, it's down in Louisiana, and it failed after a flood in 1983. So you can see the levee, <clears throat> um, the height of the levee um, in this area was about 12 feet on the riverside um, and had about eight feet of water above the riverside toe of the levee at the time the slide started to occur. Um, the, water, the river was above the river side of the toe of the levee for multiple months from January to May of 1983 in this year. And then from the um, end of May to the end of August, the river stage near the levee fell 28 feet, um, which is the most rapid fall um, from a flood elevation in the recorded history of the levee in this area. So this was the most rapid drawdown it had ever experienced. Um, in addition, heavy rainfall occurred in July and August of this year. Um, so because of the duration of the flood, um, the, well, because of the long duration of the flood, the high uh, heavy rainfall um, is likely that the clays on the riverside of the levee and the levee itself, uh, so the clays in the foundation and then the levee were saturated or near saturated at the time that the failure started to occur in late August. Um, during the failure, the levee crown subsided between four and five feet 
and move six to eight feet riverward at the start of the failure. Um, and then they continued to monitor this as the river continued to drop. Um, they couldn't do a whole lot because the river was there, but um, they, as the river fell, uh, the majority of the levee section in that area, the Riverside levee section completely failed into the river. So um, based on a review of the photos during the failure and surveys that they did during while they watched this failure occur, um, they thought this was a kind of a progressive slope failure. So it wasn't the whole slope didn't fail at once. They ate away blocks of the slope as, as they moved upstream. So um, the, uh, the Corps determined that this failure occurred most likely due to scour of the river toe of the levee um, that over steepened the levee slopes and made that levee slope unstable. So basically um, is excavating away the toe of the levee uh, made some problems. And then once the buttressing effect of the high water was removed, the levee slope started to failure, to fail. Um, they, they also looked into whether or not there was uh, a loss of strength um, due to previous slope failures in the area and due to, due to extra loading, but they weren't able to determine if this was one of the causes or not. Uh, and then I think this is the last one, maybe more second to last one. Uh, Joe Pool Dam, another Army Corps levy, or another Army Corps dam, sorry, um, down in Texas. Uh, so in uh, 1988, during a routine inspection, they noted severe cracking at the downstream edge of the embankment crest. Um, the cracking was monitored in January, until January, um, when a large slide occurred on the downstream slope. Uh, they initially thought, based on experience with other dams and, and levees in this area of the country, that it was a slide that was relatively shallow or what they uh, call the skin slide. Um, those don't generally endanger the cross section of the levee but need to be repaired. Um, so they weren't initially too worried about it, but uh, as they continued to monitor the slide, um, it continued to get larger and larger uh, by March 1989. So here's, here's the, the downstream crest has been removed and they're starting to do some work on it because um, they, they know that they need to fix the slide, but they didn't think it was a deep slide. Um, but by March of 1989, uh, near vertical scarp about 18 feet high had developed. And then, as I'll show on the next slide, uh, the slide progressed across the entire width of the embankment crest. So you can see they've, they've completely lost the crest at this point. Um, so they did a bunch of investigations because at this point they realized that this probably wasn't one of those common skin slides that they deal with in this area of the country. So they uh, they dug out the they dug out the slide and um, found that there was a soft wet layer of clay fill. It was only about three to four inches thick, but it was about three feet above the original top of natural ground. Um, they never did quite figure out exactly why this occurred. They couldn't. They went back and looked through construction records, um, but they believe that uh, there was improper handling of either unprocessed or frozen fill. Um, this fill was subjected to excessive rainfall um, and then was not removed uh, and, and replaced and, and cleaned up and made better. So it was left in place and eventually caused the failure of this area of the dam. Um, they went ahead and fixed it and Joe Pool is still in operation. So. Oh yes, this is the last example. I wanted to point this out because um, I mentioned that they have a lot of skin slides in this area of the country on their levees and dams uh, and other embankments to roadway embankments. Um, so this is one of the many shallow slides that they have on the slope of the Dallas floodway levees. Um, these levees are constructed of high plasticity clay uh, and that superficial clay desiccates and cracks as it dries out. And then when this superficial desiccated material becomes wet due to either rain or loading of the slope due to a flood, the clay loses strength and goes to residual strength, which causes these shallow slope slides. They don't go very deep because that desiccated material is pretty shallow, um, but they do look kind of ugly and require a lot of maintenance to, to fix. So, so now that I've talked about a lot of um, uh, case histories, I'm going to go through a little bit about um, performing the slope stability analysis, methods to perform slope stability analysis, and then do some examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Um, if you've done any um, slope stability analyses, you've heard of total stress versus effective stress methods. Um, and I did uh, want to talk a little bit about that because it's important to know when to use total stress methods and when to use the stress, effective stress methods. Um, but the most important thing to understand is that soil strengths are always governed by effective stresses. 
what's going on out in the field is actually governed by effective stresses. Um, however, uh, this means knowing the pore pressures uh, felt by the soil is, is incredibly important. And in some cases, it's difficult to, un to um, estimate pore pressures during an undrained loading case. So um, we uh, find it easier to predict the undrained strength rather than attempting to predict the pore pressures. And in that case, you want to use a total stress method. Um, so it's just a method of analysis. It's not what's actually going on in the field, but it's a, a reasonable approximation. So this is uh, really hard to see, but this is a clip from EM 1902. This is the shear strength and pore pressure recommendations for static design conditions. So we've got um, three cases, end of construction, steady state, and then sudden drawdown. <clears throat> they don't talk about flood loading in um, 1902 currently. But what they do is they go through shear strength recommendations for free draining and low permeability soils. They go through pore pressure recommendations for free draining and low permeability materials and how to estimate those. Um, and, and the most complicated one is sudden drawdown conditions. Um, the core requires the use of a three-stage computation method. So the first stage, um, this is just for low permeability soils. The first stage, you use drain strength. The second stage, you use undrained shear strength. And then the third stage, um, you uh, use um, either undrained or drained strength, depending upon which one is the worst case. So um, if you want more information about um, how to do sudden, draw sudden drawdowns, the three-stage analysis, um, I have a couple good paper, I have a good paper that I, that I have, and then 1901, or 1902, sorry, EM 1902. Um, the slope stability guidance also has a good, uh, I think it's an appendix on it. So some good discussion. So um, a loading that wasn't considered in our and isn't considered in our current guidance and is a bit uh, a bit of an oversight. Um, I think a pretty big oversight is flow loading. Uh, so <clears throat> it's a little harder to evaluate because it's very similar to rapid drawdown loading, um, in a, in that you should be doing kind of a three stage analysis. Um, but current slope stability software isn't set up to perform that same three step method. Um, so. The recommendation in the draft version of the levy design guidance, which is the current guidance that has this, um, this flood building condition, uh, recommends comparing results from an undrained and from an effective stress analysis. Um, this is still draft, so I, I don't know if this will, will be finalized this way or if they will come up with anything else, but really they're trying just to come up with a way to um, best model this without killing you because of the many computations you need to do. So um, it's still kind of in um, development form, but this is definitely an important case to model is flood loading. So different failure analysis methods. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple different ways to do it. Um, uh, uh, the most basic method is a translational failure analysis. Um, this you can use particularly in stratified soils where you know the stability is gonna be controlled by a specific layer um, particularly a relatively thin and weak layer, um, or it's limited by a, a much more uh, thick, much stronger layer I'll show in, in a few minutes. Um, so this analysis is a kind of a force balance analysis. Um, it calculates the forces for a potentially translating mass. So um, it, it's, it's like a free body diagram. It's kind of what you're developing, but without moments. So the comparison is between the destabilizing forces of an active pressure wedge with the stabilizing forces of a passive wedge plus the shear strength of a central soil mass. So I'll show you that in a second. On this slide. So here's that figure showing the different wedges in the translational failure analysis. You've got the left, the active driving block, which is trying to push the slope down. Um, in the middle is your neutral or translating block. And on the right is the resisted, the passive resisting block. And you can see that um, failure surface extending to the weak layer. Um, and this analysis isn't really reasonable unless you have that weak layer or that limited layer that you know your failure is going to go through. <coughs> me. So here's a little more complicated version of that when you're going through a layered system. So in this case, um, they don't have a, a weak layer, but there's a, a firm base, is what they call. So a much stronger layer, either a much stronger, maybe sand layer, 
or a uh, uh, bedrock layer. And so you know your shear is going to go through there. Um, and then the, the potential wedge is a little more complicated um, because you have different layers. And um, the shear surface needs to be adjusted as it extends through each stratum because each stratum has different strength properties. <clears throat> and you can see here the different stratums and how they how those angles are calculated. They're a function of the um, uh, uh, friction angle of the soil. So this isn't a common method to use. Um, I don't see it very often. And this is can also be done in a limited equilibrium slope stability program. So I'm going to move on to the limited equilibrium method. So currently, limit equilibrium methods are the most commonly used methods to evaluate slope stability. Um, they're based on rigid body mechanics, and they balance either forces or forces and moments, depending on the specific method. Um, the method we use mostly these days is the censored method of slices, and that balances both forces and moments. Um, so that's why it's one of the preferred methods. Um, so then factors of safety are applied to strength values to evaluate the overall factor of safety against slope instability. And that's how they calculate the results, that that overall factor of safety. Um, so limit equilibrium methods have been in use for over 50 years. I think the most complicated and the most recently developed method was developed in like 1960, something like that, late 1950s. Um, and they're still in use today because they're relatively easy to set up, relatively easy to use, and don't require um, specialized knowledge like uh, coding for FLAC. Um, however, uh, deformation analysis methods such as FLAC um, are seeing increased application in slope stability evaluations. So um, that may be the way we're trending eventually. But right now we still use limited equilibrium pretty much pretty regularly. Um, so in, in limited equilibrium methods, you develop a method, you use the method of slices. So the soil above the shear surface is split into vertical slices, as you can see here. And the overall number of slices will depend on the analysis method and the geometry of your cross section. So some analysis methods have a minimum that you must use. And then also the, um, the, the cross section geometry will be split up properly into different sections, into different slices. Um, here's all the, the forces and moments on each slice. So you've got the weight of the uh, slice acting down. Um, that also counteracts the normal force acting up and also contributes to the shear force acting on the bottom of the slice. And then you also have um, these uh, side forces on either side here. So you've got, um, <clears throat> in some cases, they're at the same angle, and in some cases, at different angles, depending, again, upon the method you select. Um, so now we'll talk about um, some inputs that are required for slope stability analysis. Um, that soil strength, obviously pretty important unit weights, because um, that contributes to the weight of your slices and the normal forces on your slices. Cross-section geometry and stratigraphy, obviously you need to know what your model looks like and what your slope looks like. Um, the shape of your sliding surface, um, uh, the programs nowadays can do both circular and non-circular evaluations. Uh, water levels and um, pore pressure conditions in your embankment are uh, very important. As I mentioned earlier, um, slope stability is governed by effective stresses. Uh, and then piezometric modeling method um, in most uh, limited equilibrium slope stability programs these days, you can model your, your piezometric readings and, and your pore pressures in multiple ways. Um, so in addition to these inputs, you also need to select your analysis method and your a computer program that's suitable for that analysis method. Um, so as I mentioned, limb equilibrium is the most common method we use uh, for slope stability still. And um, there's different methods of slices you can look at. And again, Spencer's method of slices is kind of the default in most slope stability programs these days. Um, so that was quite a few inputs, um, which you think are pretty important and which are not so important. Any thoughts? No thoughts. Okay. Well, you're in luck because I'm going to go through some um, cross sections and analysis to kind of show you which ones tend to cause more, tend to make more of a changes to your results. So I'll walk you through the cross sections I'm going to look at real fast. Um, so the first first uh, example we're going to look at is a homogeneous embankment with the toe drain in it, so pretty standard cross section. 
the second is a zoned embankment with a chimney and blanket drain, another pretty standard cross-section you might run into. Uh, the third example, which will help us understand some pore pressure stuff, is homogeneous embankment with an artesian foundation layer. So this right here, you can see the pore pressure in the embankment, ties into the blanket drain. And then you have a piezometric line for some um, confined aquifer layers down in here. So it's a little bit higher at the toe. Um, and then also we're gonna look at a homogeneous embankment with a couple of weak clay seams in it. Um, so to look at uh, the first two uh, inputs we looked at were strength and unit weight. So uh, we're gonna look at those cross-section one and cross-section two, which was the homogeneous embankment and then the zoned embankment. Uh, so we're going to vary unit weight um, by, from negative uh, 20% of the, the one we, the unit weight we selected to up to uh, plus 20% of the unit weight we selected. And then the strengths will be varied by that same amount. Um, and we're not going to change the pore pressures at all. So here's that base case, uh, factor safety of 1.7 almost. So taking a look at adjusting your unit weight. Um, and I also have the results for the homogeneous embankment in here as well. So they range from your base case in, in this one was 1.7, and the factor safety goes from about 1.6 to 1.7. Um, and we had to take it out to do decimal points, otherwise you really wouldn't see much of a change. Same thing for um, that other homogeneous embankment um, example with the toe drain. Goes from about 1.8 to 1.95. Um, and here's that plotted on um, a graphically shown, so uh, unit weight versus factor of safety. So from this, you can kind of see that uh, unit weight doesn't really affect the results dramatically. You can change the unit weight by quite a bit, and you won't get a huge change in factor of safety. Um, and this is mostly due to the fact that unit weight contributes on both sides of that factor of safety equation. Um, it contributes both to the driving forces um, so the weight pushing, helping you push down and, and, and sail the slope, but it's also contributing to the resistance. Um, the higher unit weight, the higher your strength will be because you're looking at your stresses involved in the, in, in the normal forces. So um, it, it contributes both into the resisting and to the um, acting on the, the resisting and the driving forces. So now we'll move on to strength and Unsurprisingly, the changes in strength has a large effect on the factor of safety. So base case, again, you're looking at 1.7. Um, reducing it by 20%, you drop your factor of safety to 1.3. Increasing your strength by 20%, you reduce your you increase your factor of safety up to almost 2. So um, this indicates that you need to probably take a good look at your uh, strengths um, when you're characterizing your material properties for uh, your slope stability analyses. You don't need to spend a ton of time on unit weights, get a reasonable value and, and move on, but strengths, you need to have a good backup for what, why you selected the strengths you did. Um, and in particular, the strength of the weakest layers in your embankment are going to control your analysis. So that's really where a lot of your, your efforts should be focused, is properly characterizing those strengths. And I'll show you that weak layer um, in, a, in a few minutes. It, it can be a pretty dramatic. There's just a graphical representation. You can see it increased. It changes quite a bit. Um, so altering your uh, pore pressure conditions um, are another input parameter we want to look at, right? So in this case, we altered the anisotropy ratio um, from 1H to 1V. So um, your hydraulic conductivity is isotropic in that case. Um, and then we looked at four to one and nine to one, because that's kind of a good range of hydraulic conductivities for an embankment. Um, so uh, we'll take a look here at this. You can see that alters the actual pore pressures and the phreatic surfaces. So as we kind of saw in that um, seepage presentation, as you increase your anisotropy ratio, so as your horizontal hydraulic conductivity gets much larger than your vertical hydraulic conductivity, your uh, phreatic surface creeps further out into the embankment. Um, and in that case, uh, as your pore pressures increase, your factor of safety drops. So just looking at these results here, 
um, the factor of safety for an isotropic conditions, you get uh, almost two, and it drops down to 1.9 and then down to 1.7 as your pore pressures in your embankment increase. So as you can see, having a reasonable understanding of pore pressures um, can make a big effect on the results of your stability analysis. So properly characterizing your material properties for your seepage analysis will feed directly into a proper understanding of the um, strength of your, or the slope stability. All tied together. Okay. Um, so I mentioned that there's different limit equilibrium methods. The most common one is the Spencer method of slices. And then there's a more simplified method, simplified Bishop, simplified Yambu, and low and Kara Fife. Kara Fife, I think. Um, I don't know a lot about these three here because I've never used them. Um, I've always just used the Spencer method of slices, but really they um, they have different method. They diff they have different assumptions for the inter-slice forces, um, how they're characterized, how they're measured, and how they're calculated. Um, and, and, and the reason there's different methods is when they first started doing the limit equilibrium analyses, computers didn't exist. Um, so they had to start simplified. They had to start pretty basic so that they could actually do these analyses in a reasonable time frame. As our computing power increased, the use of more complicated methods like Spencer's, Spencer's method of slices became more common. Um, we can run a slope stability analysis in seconds now and run, you know, a, a thousand iterations and it takes five seconds. Um, even using Spencer's method of slices. So um, it, that's why we recommend using the more complicated methods these days, because it doesn't reduce or doesn't alter our workload. Um, and uh, it doesn't change the results either, really using the different methods of analysis. Um, so in this case, the factor of safety for the different methods goes from 1.9 to 1.9. Um, so the selection of methods um, really doesn't matter. So I would just stick with your default, which is Spencer's. Uh, variation of factor of safety with computer program. So the most commonly used method in the core or computer program in the core is slope W um, because you can feed CW results directly into it. My favorite uh, slope stability program is actually U Texas because um, that's what I was trained up on, and I find that the output from that is very accessible. It's easier to find, easier to read, easier to check, and make sure that, it, that we're getting reasonable results. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. These are all commercially available slope stability software. They've been validated against case histories, so it doesn't really matter. As long as you're using it properly, you will get the same results. Um, using it properly is the hard part, because the, the input methods change from model to model, from, from analysis to analysis, and from computer program to computer program. Um, pore pressure method input, so how you input pore pressures. Um, so this slide um, shows a comparison between pore pressures at the base of a slice uh, calculated from a phreatic surface um, and those calculated from a flow net or numerical seepage analysis. Uh, so pore pressures calculated um, from a flow net are based on these echo potential lines here. Um, so the pore pressure at the base of the slice is based on that height H1. You go along your echo potential line here, and you get that height H1. Uh, pore pressures calculated from a free, phreatic surface calculation, however, go straight up um, and get a, a measure H3. Um, and so you can have slightly different pore pressure calculations depending on how you input them into your result, into your software. So um, a lot of times you can import pore pressures directly from slope CW into a slope W analysis, um, and that will then give you this pore pressure based on H1. If you just plot a phreatic surface, it'll give you a slightly different pore pressure. Um, but as we'll discuss on the next slide, this doesn't usually have a large impact on results. So. Um, we had two different methods of analysis for this. We looked at a phreatic surface, so we sketched in a phreatic surface, ran the analysis, got the results, and then they also input piezometric values from a, a seepage analysis um, and assigned uh, the program, uh, assigned the result based on that. Um, the, the one method I've used a lot in the past is the phreatic surface method. Um, when I was working in New Texas, 
Um, this method is, is pretty reasonable as long as there are no artesian conditions. I wanted to point that out. Um, artesian conditions um, might occur at the toe of the dam if there's a low permeability confining layer in the foundation. Um, so you have to, if you're doing a phreatic surface model, you have to make sure you're adequately um, characterizing all layers with potentially different phreatic surfaces. So here's this one, this analysis, this model didn't have artesian conditions. Um, so you can see that the results aren't, aren't dramatically different. Um, you're looking at 1.9 to 2. Um, because the factor safety here is so high, it didn't really matter if you've got something that's kind of more on the, you know, kind of on the line of what you're looking at for your minimum factor of safety, you might want to look at this a little more closely. But um, since we probably aren't 110% uh, sure on what our pore pressures are anyways, getting super accurate in the model is probably not going to help us any more than being, you know, we're not going to be any more accurate than an order of magnitude on our pore pressures anyways. So. Um, we should, you should be doing some sensitivity studies to evaluate pore pressure conditions anyways. Um, yeah, here's the same, same thing. Um, the different, uh, this is a zoned embankment factor safety um, with phreatic surface versus piezometric values, basically at 1.7. Um, so here's looking at a section with and without artesian conditions. So if you have artesian conditions and you don't accurately model them, that can cause some issues with your factors of safety. So in this case, uh, the analysis was modeled without artesian pressures, so this phreatic surface was not included in the model. Um, and then it was modeled with these artesian pressures near the tilt of the dam. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference from 1.7 to 1.9. So accurately modeling your pore pressure regime is more important than which method you use to input into the model and put your pore pressures into the model. And then the weak layer, this is, this is kind of the big deal for me. Um, and this is where you have to play around with your analysis method to ensure you are accurately capturing the weak. If you have a weak layer and you know there's a weak layer in your model, in your cross section, you need to ensure that your shear surface extends through that weak layer. Um, because if you just run a, a, maybe a circular shear surface in slope W, it will probably come up with something like this shear surface here in the embankment which has a really good factor of safety, almost 1.8. But if you accurately capture the slope stability with these clay seams included, your factor of safety drops quite a bit. So you have to make sure that when you're modeling your, your analysis that you're not just going with what the program thinks is the weakest. You have to tell the program what you think is the worst case. But I only had an hour for this presentation. Oh, I have an hour and a half. Hmm. Okay. So important inputs. What do you what do you, what do we come up with? Strength? Big deal? Pore pressure conditions? Big deal? Knowing your pore pressures is more important than knowing um what method and then than selecting the right method to input it and having exact numbers in your model. Um, if you don't have the accurate pore pressures, you're probably not going to have accurate piezometric conditions. You're probably not going to have an accurate model anyways. Um, Cross-section stratigraphy can be important because that can control the shape of the critical shear surface. Uh, if you have that weak layer in there, that's kind of a big deal. Um, unit weight analysis method and computer program. You have to get a reasonable unit weight. You don't want, uh, if you have a unit weight of 120 PCF, you don't want to model it as like 80 PSF, but 115 is no different than 120, is no different than probably 130. You know, it's, 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 as long as you get a reasonable number, you're okay. Analysis method, just go with Spencer's method of slices. Computer program, use whatever program you can get for the most reasonable cost. Um, if you're in the core, you probably have access to Slope W. You also have access to UTexas if you can get Erdic to give you the access codes, which I have not managed in the six years I've worked for the core, so unfortunately, it, you may not be able to have access to it, um, but we do have free use of UTexas. Uh, pore pressure input method is not typically critical as long as you accurately portray your pore pressures. 
Um, any questions on input, stuff like that, before I talk about some different cases? Okay, so I'm actually going to look at right now the construction cases and the steady state cases. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, rapid drawdown too. I won't talk about flood loading um, because it's still kind of up in the air about how you evaluate it. Um, I'm not, I don't want to make any promises in the course today. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this and out, this cross section here. And uh, one, we're going to look at an, a construction, which is an undrained total stress analysis, and then a steady state drain defective stress analysis. And I'll walk through each of the materials that we have in this cross section and why I selected the material properties I did. Um, but we have a zoned embankment dam on uh, clay and sand foundation. So the embankment has a shell here in, in orange. It's got a green core there and then a little skinny red filter drain system. Um, and then in the foundation, you've got a, a clay layer in blue here and a sand layer in yellow here. So uh, we've assigned unit weights to all these, and that ranges from 110 PCF for the clay to 135 PCF for the shell. Um, those are kind of reasonable ranges for sands and clays. Uh, that's probably what you'll see the most. You'll get lower unit weights in clays along rivers, um, or uh, you, you'll see for uplift, like for uh, blanket theory analyses. But this is kind of a common range you'll see for a dam. Um, and then the strength values looking over here. So this is a, what we consider a total stress analysis because we're not really good at estimating pore pressures that are occurring during construction because you've got compaction going on. It's probably not fully saturated. You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on that makes it much more difficult to estimate pore pressures. So we're going to do a, an undrained strength analysis. Um, so we're going to look at uh, First, to compare, you've got, you got the free draining soils and you've got low permeability soils. That's what, what I pointed out in the, um, the, the table from the EM1902. So you want to look at, determine if the material is going to be free draining or if it's going to be a lower permeability non-free draining soil. So in this case, this shell material is a, a sandier soil, maybe gravelly soil, so it's going to be free draining and we're going to assign it a drain strength for all cases. Um, and do the same with the filter and drain material. It's going to stay free draining. It's not going to build up pore pressures during shearing. And then also the sand layer at the bottom here is considered free draining. So we'll, we'll um, have a drain strength for this analysis. Um, then the two finer grain soils, so the core and the clay foundation soils, um, were consumed to be low permeability enough in this analysis to not be free draining. So they were assigned undrained shear strength. Um, and in this case, the undrained shear strength is a cohesion with zero friction. So that's kind of what you see when you do an undrained strength calculation or undrained, undrained test. You see it's just a cohesion and no, no uh, uh, friction angle in this case. So these were selected um, based on the uh, material properties of this and calculations in lab testing. Uh, so, and then for the steady state case, um, all materials are assumed to be free draining because this is kind of a steady state, um, no movement of, of water. So pore pressures have dissipated from construction, from initial filling, all that. So you can look at um, uh, undrain. You can look at um, uh, effective stresses, effective stress to, uh, strengths for all of these, strain strengths for all of these. So we've added drain strengths for the core and the clay in here. That's the only difference in this model. And then also which isn't necessarily required, um, but you can have a um, saturated unit weight here, 142, so this would be your, your unit weight below the shear surface and then the unit weight above the shear surface or a um, partially saturated unit weight. But as I pointed out earlier, unit weights don't dramatically affect the results of your analysis, so this kind of detail is maybe not necessary in all cases. All right, so I, this is that construction case, total stress analysis, um, subsurface water conditions are what's out there prior to construction. So that's what's in the, in the foundation. Um, there's no assumed, you don't have to worry about pore pressures in the embankment because um, there aren't any in the drain stuff. And then in the um, 
a clay layer in the core, you've assumed uh, undrained strength, so you don't need to know your um, pore pressures. Uh, minimum factor safety from EM 1902 for this is 1.3. Uh, so here's the results of an undrained strength, and uh-oh, that's probably not going to work. So you may need to look at flattening your slopes, um, other other ways to to increase your strength in this case, increase your stability. Shucks. All right. So steady state seepage. Um, your water conditions are from a steady state seepage analysis. You're looking at say a PMF event um, or whatever your team has selected as your design water condition. That right now I usually, I believe is, is usually like a SPOA design flood or a PMF um, and that may change based on risk-based, risk-informed design as we get into risk-informed design more and more. There may be a specific case that controls your design from a risk standpoint. Um, it's effective stress analysis and use drain strength for all materials. Minimum factor safety for this is 1.5 is required by EM 1902. Okay, and here's the results. You can see in this case the reservoir elevation is pretty high in this, so it's probably pretty close to either a spillway design flood or a reservoir elevation or a PMF elevation at the time of design. Um, they, and they this analysis this comes from a Steady state seepage, seep W analysis results. These are all uh, slope W model results, just from looking at them. Um, and the factor safety is reasonable. So rapid drawdown. This is the fun one. And this is one, if you run a rapid drawdown analysis, you want to, one, review the core guidance on it in the EM 1902. And you'll also want to look into the how inputs are input into your stability software. Both Slope W and U Texas have different ways to input values for rapid drawdown. They have different methods. So you want to make sure you're inputting it based on the way that they want to input for that slope stability software. Um, so you use a three-stage analysis. It's called the Duncan, Wright, Duncan Wong and Wright method um, because they're the ones that developed it. Um, it's fundamentally a total stress analysis, um, but you look at effective stresses, strength, and total stress strength. And you compare the two and determine which strength is going to govern your analysis results. Minimum factor safeties can range from 1.1 to 1.3 for this, depending upon the criticality of your structure, I believe. Oh, sorry. The, the uh, minimum factor safety required for analysis is 1.1 when evaluating for drawdown from maximum surcharge pool and 1.3 when evaluating drawdown from maximum storage pool. I knew there was a reason. So here's, your, here's what the results of a, a rapid drawdown analysis look like. This is a figure that's been shown in many, many rapid drawdown papers. Um, so you look at, you have two phreatic surfaces, one before drawdown, one after drawdown. I highly recommend you do this just based upon this before drawdown can come from a, a slope W model or CW model after drawdown. Honestly, I'd probably sketch something in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't attempt to figure out what pore pressures are going to look like in here. You don't do a transient analysis. You don't want any of that. Um, this method accounts for pore pressures during shear. So you don't have to try to estimate what pore pressures are going to look like during drawdown and you definitely shouldn't. It's not worth your time and effort. Okay. And then I think I'm almost done. There's some easy ways to kind of start your cross-section modeling. Um, if you don't, if you're starting from scratch, you don't know what things are gonna look like out there. You do kind of know what kind of soils you're gonna have. Here's some slopes you can start with. You can start with two to one, up to four to one slopes, depending upon your material properties. This comes from uh, Reclamation's Design of Small Dams guidance. I don't think it's something they update anymore, but it's a useful, a very useful text. Um, upstream slopes tend to be uh, tend to have to be flatter to account for rapid drawdown because they're subject to rapid drawdown. Downstream slopes can be steeper. Um, however, you do have to take in considerations of if you're going to have a grass slope, um, it needs to be able to be mowed. 
And a lot of times um, people mowing don't want your slopes to be steeper than two to one. So you have to consider uh, construction and maintenance considerations in addition to uh, stability considerations. So there's a lot that goes into this evaluation of reasonable slopes. If you have rocks with slope, you can go a lot deeper because you don't have to uh, mow it. Uh, and here's the figure that goes with that table. So uh, this shows recommended core widths as well. Uh, so the selected width of the core is a balance between a uh, wider core to prevent uh, seepage issues and a thinner core to reduce the potential for slope instability. Because a lot of times your core is a, a weaker material and your slopes are there to buttress the core and keep it in place. Uh, Michelle, I mean. Thank you guys. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Duke.